All right. For the fresh faces in the audience, uh, we have a combined for uh, we have a combined adult and uh, kids study. We define kids as you have to go to school and you don't get to pay for it. So that's the that's who we will work with first, and then we'll get into deeper and deeper things as we move along. Hopefully. Okay. Maggie, did you eat today? Here you left your room this morning. Did you eat today? Did you eat today? Yeah. I'm clearly looking at you, Bethany. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Will you eat again tomorrow, Andrea? Yeah. Ah, me too. It's on the agenda. All right? Why, why do you have to eat tomorrow? Devin, why are you going to eat tomorrow? Because you got to keep your energy up. Is that the only reason? You only eat for energy. I'll remind you of that tonight when you try to cook popcorn. <laughs> Why are you going to need to eat tomorrow? Okay, so you'll live. I'm thinking way more simple and way more basic than that. Because I'm hungry. I'm going to be hungry tomorrow. If you don't eat, you get hungry. All right? Is there ever a time that you can foresee in your life besides the need to live and for energy... That you won't need to, to eat. You can eat enough. That you, I can go crush a Chinese buffet and not eat for the whole rest of the day. That don't happen too often. I'm usually not that smart. But you could. Is there a time where you'll never eat, need to eat again while you're living on this earth? No. Why? Because you're going to get hungry. And you're going to need that food. Okay. While you think about that. We need a reader. Damon, read for us. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, and finding none, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first. This parable is a lot like eating, okay? If you don't have Jesus, the hungry, or if you don't have food, the hungry shows up, right? If you don't have Jesus, the demons show up. And regardless, devote your life to Jesus. We sang that song, I have decided to follow Jesus, right? Bethany, you decided to follow Jesus Sunday. Yeah. Okay. I have decided to follow Jesus Bethany's following so well, she's already been here three hours and we just got started. I've been here before anybody. <laughs> if you don't keep that up, you'll get hungry. Your spirit should get hungry. What happens if you don't eat? Starve to death. You starve to death. What happens if you're not partaking of spiritual food? You starve to death. All right. Another reader for me real quick, please. Go ahead. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever, whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall, not thir shall never thirst. But I, sh but I said to you, that you have seen me and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Give us this bread always. Okay, so there is the lesson that we should take away from the parable. Just as a reminder that you get hungry reminds you to partake of mass quantities, to quote a terrific movie consuming mass quantity anybody know the movie coneheads yeah no? okay fine um satan is never going to stop coming after you and if you are not partaking of spiritual food you can starve to death if you eat are you hungry afterwards why not because you might
Because you're full. There's another word for that. Some people don't eat till they get full. I know. It's a really weird concept. Do you, do you, you probably do. It's an S word. Starts with an S. You eat till when? Satiated. You're <laughs> satiated. Yeah. <laughs> eat till you're satiated. <laughs> satisfied. Yes, yeah, satisfied. You eat till you're satisfied. You, until you get enough. So, sometimes that's more than one verse of the Bible. Sometimes that's more than one or two sermons on Sunday. Sometimes that's more than praying for just a couple of minutes. Who has prayed long? Uh, you, you pick the definition. Who has prayed long prayers? Yeah. Do you feel better afterwards? Because you felt you you felt like you needed to do that. Like nobody made you do that. You felt like you needed to do that. Sometimes you need to do that. Sometimes you need to sit down at the Chinese buffet of prayer. Yeah, I said it. And stay there for a while, communing with God. Sometimes you need to munch on that bread of life for a really long time to be satisfied. Okay? What and if you don't. If you are not being nourished by the bread of life, then there's empty space. Satan, Satan, he's going to come after you anyway. So we can do like they said here in John chapter 3 and verse 34. Sir, give us this bread always. It's not wrong to ask Jesus to strengthen you. It is not wrong to ask Jesus to help you. It is not wrong to ask Jesus to make you hungry for His Word. Okay? That perfectly acceptable to go to Him and, and just ask to, to want more. We pray, Somebody prayed that Sunday. And I was like, that's awesome. Was it, was it Little Dow? Somebody prayed that this past Sunday to want to want you more. It's absolutely beautiful. You have any questions? Does this help with the parable? Sarah, you got a question? No. <laughs> I look for anybody. You can't move in here. <laughs> All right. Okay. Adults, any questions before we get started? Sweet. Uh, remember the context of what's going on. It is the end of what we studied last week. That starts with Jesus casting out a demon. And then they say... You're working by the power of Beelzebul. And Jesus says, y'all are being silly. Corrects them. Gives them a parable. And we talked about that last week. And then has a discussion and says something I'm, I'm kind of saving toward the end. And gives this parable. Okay. So here is our uh, parable for the evening. And we'll read it again. When the unclean spirit had gone out of, the per, out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and finding none. It says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house swept and put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of the person is worse than the first. So, Jesus had just cast out a demon. He's maybe even still standing next to the guy or, or close to the person and has cast out the demon. This parable starts when the unclean spirit, okay? That's, that's a proper translation. It's not um, a weirdness coming over from the Greek. It's not supposed to be when a, or when an, rather, when an unclean spirit. It's not a hypothetical maybe sometimes this has the definite article of the. So, simple question, and it's kind of a trick question. Is Jesus talking about this, the demon he just cast out? Yes, hands for yes, it's the demon he just cast out. No, it's not the demon he just cast out, hands. I don't know, hands, hands. It doesn't matter, hands. <laughs> Okay, all right. It might be, um, what would be the difference in the warning? I mean, how else would you say it? If you were trying to give this parable, how else would you say the parable? Uh, the warning 
would be only slightly different only because of the manifestations of what the demon can do. Right? So what I mean is this. If a demon comes into them, what can the demon do? Remember what had happened to this person? He was unable to do what? Speak. He's not able to speak. Uh, the the one at um, the one that I referenced last week, the the demoniac at the tombs of Ger of the Gerasenes, he was cutting himself. He was howling all night. He was running around naked. They were doing things. So that would be a warning for the for the people who were standing around. What would be the warning for us? Because, like we said, Revelation chapter 20, first few verses there, demons, uh, Satan and his power are bound. Um, so what's the warning for us then? If you have been cleansed, then what, what can the demon do? Or what could Satan do? Bring reinforcement. Right. And how would that look in your life? How would that manifest? Little, thing, little cracks in your armor, little things seeping in, until there's many things seeping in, and the next thing you know, you're back out in the same shape you were, or worse. Temptations. And, temptations. And, and acting on them. I mean, temptations are common to man. It, you're going to be tempted. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to enter... Go ahead. Indulge. To indulge, to go into and doing this. So the warning here then for us, even if it's uh, slightly different than it would be for them, is the more powerful, right? So let's read it again or look at it uh, again real quick. He goes in verse 26 and brings seven spirits more evil. How would that, how does that look for us? <clears throat> Drug addiction is a big problem in uh, many areas of the country. We are familiar with it, especially here. If someone has beaten an addiction, what it means is they don't do that thing anymore. And many people will, or many, many experts agree, and it's not perfect agreement, but many experts do agree, the best expert, that you always still want that thing. That whatever it was you were addicted to, you always have at least some part of you that could be like, yeah, I could, I could do that again if the situation was right, if the timing was right, if, if the thing happened just right, I, I would probably have very, very difficult time. I'd, I'd have to fight that addiction again, even if it's something you've gotten far beyond. Again, temptation's not a sin. If you cast that out, if you've gotten rid of that sin in your life and you allow it to come back in, it's going to be more difficult to deal with if you have re-entered into that indulgence. Okay. Think about that for a minute. I've kind of separated that so that we can, we can kind of percolate on it. Um, and it'll come back up in just a moment. Where does the demon go? In waterless places seeking rest. What? Oh no! How how ironic! Also, uh, waterless places. He goes through waterless places seeking rest. the The wording here is a barren place. It is also the word for an uninhabitable place. It's also a word for wilderness. Desert, they all would fit underneath the umbrella of this of this um, this word. It's a spiritual plane, even though for the people who are listening to Jesus speak at this time are going to think a physical plane, like it's a place here on earth you can put your finger on the map and that's where the demon went to or got sent to, that it was a popular belief for them at the time. Ellicott's commentary for English readers says the description reflects the popular idea that the parched deserts of Syria and Arabia and Egypt were haunted by demons who thence came to invade the bodies of the souls of men. So in the book of Tobit, the demon Asbodius 
flees to the upper parts of Egypt. The book of Tobit is a, a religious book. It is not part of your Bible. It's not supposed to be part of your Bible, but it is a, uh, a popular or for certain religion, popular uh, religious book uh, offering this information. You can look at cultures throughout the world and the boogeyman lives somewhere. You don't go to swamps at night, right? That's, you don't go down to the woolly swamp at night. Um, it's, a, it's a popular belief. Uh, it just means he goes somewhere where there's nobody at. He goes to a not cool place that you don't want to be in anyway. Uh, kind of foreshadowing what's going to happen to them in the future. Yes, sir. The evil spirit still inhabit mankind today. Okay. Hmm. It's a very loaded question. And this is why. How do you say no? But what can they do is a different question. Or what are they allowed to do? And that I think we can say is absolutely limited. If at all. If, if they're still interacting at all. Um, it is my personal belief that all of those spiritual entities have been bound so that the Word of God can create its perfect work. So the scales have been evened with God doing miracles, Satan even calling down the fire of God in the case of Job to do things the scales have been evened and the playing field is that there's nothing going on except what you and i can see touch feel whatever and the word of god doing its work okay so just like you would say well did an angel come and talk to you about doing a thing and say well if he did it would have to be exactly what the word of god says right it would, if he did anything to inspire you, it would be to be pointing back to God in the way that the Bible says it. I think a demon would be equal but inverse, in that the little demon on your shoulder whispers in your ear, "You should do that, that sin. You should enter into that sin." They have no ability to control, right? There's nobody out there. Um, there's no demon out there who's possessing bodies even though the catholic church for years and years and years and other churches and other non-christian um shamans and witch doctors and, and, and whatever you like did exorcisms and believed it and that's part of the believing that ellicott's going on about here um are they still active i don't think they're allowed to be i base that off of um a passage from Zechariah, I think it's Zechariah 13, and Revelation chapter 20, where it talks about um, Satan being uh, bound for a thousand years. Well, that same period is what we're living in now, that he is bound in darkness. Um, he is locked in a pit, and he is not going to be released until the time frame is over. Let's go look at it real quick. It's Revelation 20. I've referenced it several times in I probably should have just gone here earlier. Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw the thrones, and those seated on them, and those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received a mark on its foreheads or in hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. I'm going to stop there. Um, the discussion is this period. The, um, there's a lot of imagery in there. Um, what happens when someone comes out of the grave of baptism? They have been resurrected to a new life, right? That's it's language you can find throughout the Gospels and throughout our scriptures. That's this thousand year period. 
it's not a literal 1,000 years worth of Earth revolutions around the sun. The 1,000 refers to a complete time period. It should be 10. 10 refers to a complete thing. Well, 10 to the third power would indicate uh, deity involvement, God's involvement. So the complete amount of time that God has set, well, that we know. Who knows when Jesus is coming back? No one but God alone. So for this time frame, what it says is that there is a binding of Satan. Exactly what is that? Well, it talks about chains and pits, all imagery of, of revelation, meaning in some form or fashion, wherever he is and however he is, he is limited because the, the, the thing that happens because he is bound, we are told so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. They're left alone. We, we are left alone so that we can be resurrected for the th so that the church age can happen, if that language works for you. So long answer or short answer made long. I think this is where he's at. He's bound and he can't do anything to us beyond the temptation, low-level temptation, the, the full-on deception. No. I mean, any sin you can look at now. If you want to be reasonable, you can say, no, I absolutely should not do that. But we like to sin. That's what James tells us, right? It's our desires that, that push that. Yes, sir? So, this is an honest question that I don't know the answer to. Uh, it may sound like I'm leading you into some, making a point, but I'm really not because I don't know. Is there a relationship between, say, uh, you know, people were casting out demons, Jesus was, and his apostles were casting out demons to show the work and the power of Jesus. And then at a certain point, those powers and those gifts were taken away. Is there a relationship between that and the fact that, you know, we don't we don't feel as though you, you quote unquote cast out demons anymore because nobody really has that power or authority to cast out demons. Does that make sense? Yeah, nobody has a demon, first of all, and... Nobody has the power to cast them out. That's always my argument to it, is that God wouldn't allow it because nobody can do that. Away. But now, jokingly, a lot of times I will say a person that hurts a child has to be possessed by a demon, yeah. but that's just evil, I guess. And, and we're kind of getting, yeah. we're going to get to toward that as well. Does that, does that? Yeah, but again, the verse that says that he's like a, a rolling lion speaking when he made the vow. I mean, in Revelation, it sounds like he's bound and he has no power, but yet we know from the scripture that he's in this world tempting people and wanting them to go to hell. If you have an airplane pilot in an F 22 Raptor, he has all kinds of power at both thumbs. If you shoot him down and he's running around on the ground with his M1911 pistol, he has some power, but he ain't in that airplane no more. Satan don't have that power anymore. What he can do to us is still just as effective to our soul, but he, the, it's so limited in comparison. Yes, sir. I thought you... Oh, I was you kind of answered it there, but I was going to say it's the temptations that he uses today that he can seek out. If he can seek you out in your lowest, weakest time, those temptations, like we talked about before, the attic or whatever, if you allow them, if you indulge is when he says, they will devour you. And, and Satan will use that to devour you. So that's why it says he's seeking about as a roaring lion because... The lion doesn't go in, you know, try to help us or whatever and pick out the strongest of the herd. You know, they, they prey on the on the weak, just like any predator does. So they'll go here, like Satan, he'll go here and check this Christian. He'll go here and check this Christian and say, well, you know, I'll come back. Maybe you're strong right now. He'll come back and check you later and say, hey, you're a little weaker and I'm going to hit you with something. So he puts those temptations out there. And like you said, given the... If you don't use God to, to keep him off, if you don't flee from him, as God says, then it will. He'll, he'll use those temptations and he will devour you like a lion. Devour your soul. Yes, ma'am. 
Well, he kind of said it. I was just thinking back to things, you know, at different stages in your life, there's different temptations. And when you're living in the one that, you know, you know, it just seems like the most powerful thing in the world. I can look back on things, you know, five or ten instances in my life, you know, that now that wouldn't be a temptation for nothing in the world. But it was, it was magnified it was everything, and it's hard to resist, or, you know, when you didn't resist and you give in. It, Satan's got that power, but if, if we'll trust in, in the Lord, that, that can be nothing later in life. It, like you said, limited is a good word to what we want it to be limited to. Go on a diet and see how long it takes somebody to offer you a donut. <laughs> <laughs> it don't have to be the Chinese buffet. <laughs> just that one Krispy yeah, Kreme. I just that on Facebook. Right. Oh, okay. Especially when you're a new Christian. Yeah. Bethany, this is a good advice for you. Know, as Trey said, it's of those times, you know, Satan will come to you and he'll test you with things that you used to do and you used to like. He'll put those in front of you. And, and you've got to use God and, and His Word to, to flee from Him. One more place I'll point out when we, we read about our spiritual armor last week, it says that those battles that we fight, what that armor is for is fighting in heavenly places. It is spiritual battles that we are fighting and that you know now we're empowered. So is Satan powerless completely? No. But does he have the abilities that he had before? And one of them that I think is most severely limited is that before there are three instances in the Old Testament where he stands in front of the presence of God. That's not allowed anymore. Your accuser can come stand before God on the final day. It says in Revelation, he must be released for a little while. Yeah, to come to the judgment seat to be judged. But the limitation I, it is a great way to, to understand it. Still very dangerous. Um, okay, there's anything else? That's the second most powerful at time with Jesus was here on earth. So the question is, was Satan most powerful when Jesus was here on earth? I think that the climax of his effectiveness, yes. But what his absolute ability to do things, I think has... Um, I don't know that I could say that's the same answer. I don't know a better answer. Well, if he didn't have any power whatsoever, he'd be real easy to go to church. He, yeah, yep, yeah. Everybody would run to the door. Uh, if he didn't have a whole lot of power and a whole lot of things going for him right then, it would have been, look how absurd it was for Jesus to be crucified. I mean, it's really hard to condemn an innocent man when even the guy who's going to condemn him says, he's an innocent man. Okay, we'll kill him anyway. I don't, I'm not, I don't mean to be irreverent. But... Look how absurd it was for them to be able to do that. So it maybe that's a great not answer for you. <laughs> um, uh, one more thing. What was the what was the very first tool or weapon, whatever, however you want to put it? What was the very first tool or weapon that that Satan used? Where? Temptation. Wow, if you prayed, old man calls us to sin through temptation. And chiefly with words, deceit, with words. deceit, lies. Okay, there is two major differences in Matthew's. I left a blank there on your page, right? One of them is at the end of Matthew's account, it says, so also it will be with this evil generation. Does anybody know what the other one is? I know you didn't have a chance to look at this ahead of time, but... The other difference in Matthew and Luke's account, the two places where this is, is the word empty. Everything else is almost exactly the same. But verse 44 of Matthew 12 says, And when it comes, that is the returning of the demon, it finds the house empty, swept, and put in order. And Luke's going to say swept and put in order. And then at the end of the parable, Matthew adds... 
or also um, writes for us, so also it will be with this evil generation. We're going to look at the word empty here for a few minutes, and um, it'll a little bit twist our conversation to allow it to continue to move forward. Um, what might the significance be of that house still being empty? We have to clean the no other demons came in. Okay. There's no one on watch. And I say that because no one's there and no one's there to keep watch in case if someone comes in. Okay, can I stop you? Who do you want there? Jesus. Woo! Did you have more? Well, whenever someone is coming into your house, you rob you fucking deep in the night as we get told. He comes back. He, came to, he was there at the house and then he got booted out. He's come back with reinforcements. And when you're not ready for that to enter you, and when things are going so well and you've not been on watch and you've not been ready, sometimes you get attacked extra hard and it feels like the roof can fall in on you. Things come down and that's when it's hard. When things have been going good and you get hit by hard times, whatever that may be, it's when you're at your weakest and they can really get you. So, to keep that from happening, that absolutely wonderfully said, put Jesus there. Invite him over. Is that a biblical concept? Anybody want to throw a scripture out? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, <clears throat> whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Who would you expect? Who might you expect to be in there other than God or Satan, the power of Satan? Who might you expect to be able to put in your the the home of your heart? Okay. Your idols. Your idols. Your family. Anything else? Yourself. You would think even the most selfish person, after they have gotten rid of a thing, could put themselves in the place of their heart. The verse preceding our parable, whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters, even if it is yourself, and maybe it is, it's not God, and that might be worse than whatever was there in the first place, because now I am enlightened, now I know better, and I still choose it. The second state is worse than the first. Now I know that this is a bad thing, and yet I choose to do whatever I want because I'm in charge. The second state is worse than the first. Now I'm doing great. What is go what goes on with so many of the uh, conversion stories of the Bible? What is the message of John the Baptist? What is the message of Jesus? It starts with an R. Repent. Repent. It means I recognize something is wrong. Something is broken. Second state is worse than the first. You cannot fill your heart with yourself. You cannot be your own God. That will be not the power of God. And that is what is against God. You talking about the, we're talking about the house being empty and the second state being being worse than the first. If you've ever if you've ever been a Christian for years and, and grew up grew up knowing God's word and learning God's word and stuff, and then went back out into the world, and I have, then it's a lot harder for the for God's word to penetrate the second time. And it's harder because you you know the truth, you know, nobody can tell you anything that you don't already know as far as what you're doing, you know. So it's harder. You you get a lot worse shape than you were the first time around. You've never been there, so you know that's a, then your pride kinda gets involved too. 
Yeah. There's a lot of it's a lot harder to get back if you if you've ever been there. <laughs> to make the answer my, the question short for number five, I don't think there's any significance to the number of demons that's going on here. It's not seven demons. He brings back seven more demons. It's eight. The number eight doesn't work for uh, a whole lot of spiritual significance in this case as, as far as what the symbolism would say. If you really, really, really want to try to use seven, I don't think you can. Um, but it would be something about a complete or uh, uh, the right amount of God, and, uh, divinity and humanity overcoming a thing. It, it doesn't really work. So eight's a good number to let us know just more and more of it. Um, and it can speak towards the passage here from Hebrews chapter 6, for it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the Word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and have fallen away to restore again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm, and holding Him up in contempt personally feel like this is discussing salvation um, overall, meaning baptism and the commitment of life. Um, there would be another reading of this to discuss uh, what it is that causes you to repent. So Acts chapter 2 all the way up to verse 36, that kind of sermon, that thing that affected their heart to make them ask, men and brothers, what shall we do? that thing won't be effective for them in the future. Doesn't mean there might not be another effective tool, but that one has served its purpose and they've turned their back on it. Or whatever it was that they turned their back on. People that leave the church because of insult or perceived insult um, is going to be a burnt bridge. You'll have to approach in a different direction uh, is what I think is going on here. We're over time here. Is there anything pressing before we close? Yes, ma'am. You know what now? Uh, yes, ma'am. Just real quick. Do you think it's possible like, for, for it to get easier for you to, for Satan to lose power like over us as we get older and like if you get stronger, like, can it get easier? And, like, I, I think about that because of the things that Debbie was saying about, you know, the different temptations, but it's like, as you grow older, your priorities change. And it's like, the older I get, the more I'm just like, all I want to do is go to heaven. I want to be a good person and go to heaven. So it's like, I didn't think about that when I was 19 years old. You know, like, oh, I did, but not the way I feel it now. So I'm just like, can it get easier? Like, can we... The, the temptation and you know all that science teacher anybody <clears throat> definition of the principle of inertia an object desires to remain doing what it's doing right if it's moving it wants to stay moving that's called momentum if it's sitting still it don't want to go nowhere it's what it, until a force acts until acted on by an outside force. All right. I think inertia is exactly what God put into the sphere of physics to show us how and what and to answer that question. The longer you do something, the easier it is to do it. The harder it is to break that thing. So your preacher says things like read your Bible. Your preacher says things like get together and, and fellowship with one another and feed off of that. Um, you have the and day by day they were breaking bread together and they were they were devoted to these things. The more you saturate their wait, satiate yourself with that in your life, the more you'll want to stay there. Is it hard to start going to the gym? I can say yes. Is it easy to keep going? Okay. Well, there's there's a great... <laughs> there, there's a, there, and that's a really good one. Is it hard to get started on a diet? I don't know. <laughs> Is it easier to keep a diet lifestyle going once you've got it established in your life? Yes. It... Huh? <laughs> 
<laughs> they, they not me. <laughs> it's Patrick. We're blaming it all on Patrick. There was a hand. <laughs> Yeah, I think absolutely people can get to a point where they, they don't want. And it's it, their choice. It's not it is a choice. And they could choose to turn around. But and, and that goes to the unforgivable sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. If you think you can be saved in any way other than submitting to God, you can't be forgiven of that because you're not going to be forgiven of that. You can't just undo that. That's a principle that guides your life. And if you allow yourself to be deluded to that point, then you know what is going to be able to turn you around? The power of God. But there again, you present the gospel to someone. You have them break down in tears in front of you. They know and understand and absolutely believe the truth. And they refuse it. What are you going to do? I, what, it's their choice. That's that one of the awesome. That if you're not going to, if, if you're not going to answer, then then the answer is no. So what do you do in those situations? Keep praying. Um, you can't make people do things. God doesn't even do that to us. And if we want to be like God, then we have to say, okay, I'm going to do everything I can. And I'm going to honor your choice of saying no. Yes, ma'am? Sometimes we need to change our approaches too. If, and that's, that's coming from me and experiences that I've done. Why aren't they doing that? Why haven't they done that? I've told them this way. This, 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 this. How come they won't come that way? Well, maybe it's me. Maybe it's how I'm approaching it. And I need to change something I'm doing. Maybe I need to ease up a little bit and rethink about this person and what they're going through and try a different door, try a different approach. How, I, how am I coming to that person? They may be having this block and you keep trying to hit it at that way, that same way, and that same way every time. And then sometimes someone else will come around and they, they speak to that person. They've done something different, something some way. Or it may just been that person that just spoke to them, whatever, and it changes their mind. And it opens that door. And how many of us have been like, I've spoke to this person in my life, in my family, or whatever, about a hundred times. And then they go and speak to whoever. And for whatever reason, it put into motion. It put it into motion what God wanted and what God needed. And it's on their own time. But sometimes it may, we need, need to think about how are we doing it? If it ain't working, you keep hitting your head on the door. Maybe try a hammer. Maybe try a, a, a different key. Maybe try a different way. It's hard. It's a difficult balance on are they ready to accept it? And am I giving it to them the right way? Jeremy's teaching class next Wednesday night. This is a hard class to teach. I'll be praying for you. Oh, well, I've got it covered. <laughs> I'll be praying for y'all. <laughs> Thank you.